Thank you, Nancy. Uh, and thank you everyone for joining us for the second session of the SUNY Online Summit. And I do hope that you will um, uh, follow along uh, in, the, in the chat with any questions that you might have and with some of the, um, the things that Rolando is gonna present for us. And, and I'm very happy to have, to have Rolando here to, to kick off the, the first um, uh, external uh, presentation to the summit. Uh, y primero quiero decir una bienvenida muy calurosa para nuestro amigo Rolando Méndez de la Universidad Inter Interamericana de Puerto Rico. So a very warm welcome for our friend and colleague Rolando Méndez, who's the Director of Online Academic and Student Services at the Inter-American University of Puerto Rico, uh, which you have to tell us what the temperature is there, uh, Rolando. Um, Rolando Rolando helps uh, the institution's faculty uh, immerse, navigate, and master online learning through mentoring and training. And Rolando, thank you very, very much for being with us today. Very excited uh, to introduce you to all my friends here um, at SUNY and our wider Friends of SUNY community. Thank you for being here with us. Field trip, yes, field trip to, to, to Rolando's house. I'm there. <laughs> You're all welcome and thank you for that introduction in both languages, Alexandra. And I'm excited to be here with you all. And I, it's an honor to share uh, with you folks what we have been doing at our institution. And today we're going to be talking about what our faculty development program is and how we have reconceptualized or re revitalized it uh, during the past two years, because we want to make an impact in how mm -hmm. our faculty are teaching and learning. And before I continue, I just want to make sure that everyone can see the presentation I'm sharing. It has like a light bulb made out of construction paper. Perfect. So like Alexander said, I am Rolando Mendez. My pronouns are he, him, and his. I am the Institutional Director for Online Academic and Student Services at the Inter-American University of Puerto Rico. And basically, I work with faculty and students, helping them uh, get a better experience uh, out of the online learning. And I love sharing thoughts and ideas and practices with my peers. And you can connect with me through LinkedIn or Twitterverse, and you can also send me an email to uh, that address. I will put that information later as well. And like I said, I work at the Inter-American University of Puerto Rico, which is a private nonprofit institution. Our university has 12, uh, nine K-12 schools on nine campuses and two professional schools, one for optometry and one for law. And I want to get to know a little bit more about you who's joining in. So I would appreciate if you could go to menti.com and use code 4158220 to just point in that map where you're coming from because we have people from all over the place. Okay, those numbers are coming in and see we have many people logging in from the states. From the West Coast as well. Okay, and I saw in the chat that some of you work as, as instructional designers, other work as directors for online learning. So we have a diverse group in the audience. So a little bit about this session and how this session came to be. We know that most faculty development programs seek to improve teaching and learning. And ironically, many of them or these programs lack uh, those characteristics that they seek to inspire. And we want to innovate the way faculty ap approach a role by using the same old methods. And we need to reinvent that. We need to find different experiences for faculty so they can uh, themselves create new experiences for the students. So while we go through the session, uh, keep in mind the following three concepts, purpose, intention, and uh, sustainability. 
when we speak of purpose, it's our goal, what we set out to do, and the intention is the deliberate strategic decisions and actions we make in the pursuit of those goals and that purpose. And both purpose and intention have to be sustainable because we have to adopt practices that we can scale and that we can sustain at our institutions. And we're going to see first uh, the first steps, how we started this uh, reconceptualization process. And then I'm going to talk about the different experiences that are part of our faculty development program. And you can access this presentation through the link uh, bit.ly dash uh, think outside uh, the workshop. And most of the initiatives I'll be talking about can be implemented and to some degree at your institutions or at any institutions you have to uh, I will be including some uh, templates and forms that you can use and adopt at your institutions and use as you like. So the first uh, thing we did at our faculty, uh, our institution was assess our faculty development program and I would like to take this moment to uh, hear what you have to say about your own faculty development programs. So if you're participating uh, synchronously, you can write one of these three concept words, help for a program that needs a major reconceptualization, tweak for a program that is okay and needs some minor adjustments, and uh, three, uh, sustain for a program that is everything that you want to be. You can also use uh, go to menti.com and use code 7507 to uh, tell us, rate your faculty develop, development program. Think about the different activities that uh, they offer at your institution for faculty development. Do they need some serious thought or they need some new life injected into them? Do they need some adjustments to be what we want them to be? Or do you uh, have like the best practices and you wanna keep them? As you can see the different answers we have, our audience has, they have has faculty development programs that are okay. They need my, minor tweaks and then that uh, some of them need a major reconceptualizations. So now think about this was what our faculty development program was at our institution. At system level, level, we would offer occasional keynote conferences or workshops, one to five per year, and mostly they were oriented towards pedagogy or pedagogical themes. And then uh, we would also give uh, financial, financial assistance to participate in activities coordinated by other associations or institutions. Uh, and at campus level, uh, the campuses would offer conferences and workshop throughout the year, and they would mostly focus on technological skills, how to use the LMS, how to integrate technology, etc. And one on one, on one on one support from the online learning staff on how to do many of the things related to online learning, and also they would offer financial assistance to participate in activities coordinated by either uh, by other associations or institutions. And based on this information, how would you rate it? Do you think it was okay? Do you think it, it was uh, something that we needed to sustain or something that needed a major reconceptualization? For us, it was okay, but we knew it could be more. So let's, I'll walk you through that reconceptualization process. And the first thing we did was create the Institute for Quality in Online Learning. And this institute would be the face of all uh, faculty training and development initiatives. And the institute initiatives are run by a very small team. So if you think, uh, oh, we cannot do this at our institution because we don't have a staff that's big. Uh, when we started this, it was only two of us. <laughs> now we've gone through three and, and we're trying to sustain every activity or every uh, different experience that we offer. The second thing we did was identify competencies that we wanted to develop through our faculty and development program. We used Campos, Brenes, and Zolano's work uh, on the competencies of online instructors. And I I, we identified six competencies that would serve as the pillars for everything we would do. And the Institute's activities and initiatives were aimed at developing one of 
more of these competencies. We had pedagogical competencies such as teaching, instructional design, learning assessment, pedagogical interaction. Uh, we also have technological competencies like LMS management, edtech integration, edtech use. We also identify social competencies such as oral and written communication, synchronous and asynchronous interaction, social presence, empathy, conflict management, diversity, equity, and inclusion, teamwork, in terms of academic management competencies such as course administration, academic counseling, student retention and monitoring. And this competencies in particular were aimed at uh, department directors, department chairs, or online learning directors. So, because they needed these skills as well. And we also had research competencies so that, such as searching and identifying, evaluating, selecting, and communicating information resources, informational literacy, and of course, uh, discipline, disciplinary competencies. There's a copy of the article. It's in Spanish, and uh, you can also access it through Redelic. When Once you have access to the presentation, you can download the document or you can access through that link. Once we created this center or the, the institute, we identified the competencies, we conducted a needs assessment. So in July 2020, we administered a needs assessment to our faculty. In the survey, participants uh, indicated their training and development needs, uh, preferences, and interests. And we achieved a 43.2% response rate. I have to point out that it was. Uh, we were lucky, but it, we, we had to take the context. It was summer of 2020. Most of our faculty members were locked to the computers. They were not away for the uh, summer vacation because they were preparing for the fall and the unexpectedness of what was going to happen in the fall. So uh, we administered this at, by at the end of July. And, and, and like in one week, we had achieved that response rate. And the tool that we used for that was watermark course evaluation and surveys formerly known as evaluation kit but you can use something as microsoft forms or survey monkeys uh, to instead and it took us two months about two months to design and administer the survey and then evaluate the results and i'm not going to go into details but these are some of the uh, top choices because they would have to rank which topics they would like more um they would rank uh how they perceive, how would they rate themselves in the, each one of these competencies, and then they would rank which uh, topics they would like uh, in, in each of these competencies. So we have new technologies like virtual reality, augmented reality, adaptive learning, et cetera, uh, teaching and strategies for online courses, techniques to assess learning online courses, instructional design, uh, team group work in online courses, social presence in online courses, library data databases, information literacy, open electronic resources, uh, creating online courses in Banner, which is the uh, system information that we use, uh, academic counseling, retention strategies, etc. So once we had that information, we started uh, working on alignment, uh, like like we're doing in a, when we're designing a course, we started aligning each of the activities to those objectives and to the needs. And then we also aligned them with the, the institution's strategic priorities. The president of our institution has uh, a couple of uh, strategies or uh, institutional uh, priorities that act as a waypoint for uh, each of the areas and what we're going to be accomplishing this year. So we started to linking and aligning all of the activities, all the needs and see where would they, they would fit within those priorities to make sure that what we were uh, doing would contribute to the institution's uh, bottom line. This also gave us an opportunity to work with other areas such as the International Relations Office, Student Affairs, the Institutional Review Board or IRB, uh, the Information Access Centers, what we call the uh, uh, library here at our institution, among others. The next thing we did was uh, try to look for people who would help uh, offer these many experiences uh, in, at the Institute of Quality for Online Learning. And what we did, since we didn't have uh, any budget allocated for it at the moment, uh, what we did was uh, just uh, 
administer a survey and see, hey, who wants to share their knowledge with uh, our faculty? Who wants to share what they know? Who wants to train other faculty members, other staff? And by that time, we and, and the only time we did it was uh, we the sign up sheet. We were able to recruit 34 volunteers. But uh, we've been working after every event, we meet more people and then more people come to us. So we haven't had the uh, need to do this because people come to us, hey, I wanna help out. Or we uh, meet someone through one of our experiences, we see the potential in them and how could they help out and then we, we reach out to them. So for this, we use Microsoft Forms and I have included a template you can copy, edit and use for your own purposes. And this took us about approximately one week to create and send out to all faculty members. Any questions or comments before I uh, go into details of each of the activities we started uh, working on as part of our reconceptualization process? No questions in the chat yet. Okay, perfect. So one of the first things we did was create an online community of practice and we use our learning management systems. We use Blackboard and we use our communities feature and we created this uh, place we called Comunidad de Practica de Docentes en Línea, which is community of practices of online uh, instructors. And we enroll all the institutions uh, faculty in it. And then we started creating, it was, we, we, we used a, a backwards design process. We first <laughs> included everyone there. This, we, then we started figuring out how we would configure the, the community. And then we have four main areas in this community. The idea center, which we use the discussion boards or discussion forums for faculty to share their doubts, questions, ideas, and best practices. We also created a learning center, and in this space is where we uh, publish any uh, asynchronous uh, courses that we uh, create for faculty. This is where the links to all the uh, rooms for synchronous uh, training and development activities are, or recordings of past events and or self-paced mini courses. We also have the knowledge center, which links to important resources for online teachers. Uh, online teaching like policies, pr uh, procedures, academic calendars and templates, et cetera. And we did this uh, as a compliance uh, effort, you know, to make sure that we were communicating the information uh, to all faculty members. And then we had the help center. First it linked to uh, the Blackboard Help Center, but then during the course of this uh, pre-conceptualization process, we started working on our own help center. So we started linking to our own help center and all the articles that we have published there. And in the near future, we want to uh, include faculty volunteers and mo as moderators, but still, we still need to figure out the guidelines on how we're going to implement it and, and those guidelines that they can use and how we're going to give the access, etc. But here's uh, here are a couple of screenshots of the community of practice is the welcome, then the links to the idea center, the knowledge center. These are the discussion forums where they have uh, for like technical questions, uh, share best practices, uh, share resources. And this is a, a, a screenshot of the knowledge center where we have the links to the academic calendars, to norm, uh, institutional policies and procedures and compliance efforts, etc. So how did it go? Uh, the community of practice or la comunidad de practica para docentes en línea, it became a direct channel for us to communicate with our faculty. It was imperative that we could reach out to faculty because sometimes we have to go to many channels of communication. So that the essential message gets out to them. So this became a direct channel for us to communicate with our faculty to share information relevant to their roles, needs, and interests. It also became a hub for faculty training and development efforts specifically to make sure that we could keep track of who was joining and using authentication processes similar to those that occur on, in online courses. And so they could understand the importance of those processes as well. It became a space uh, 
to exchange ideas, resources, and best practices in online teaching, as well as a feedback loop for us because we had faculty reaching out to us, uh, giving us suggestions, asking us how could, uh, if we could do something else, work on an initiative, and, and it beca also became a feedback loop for us and a platform to support compliance, like I said, with institutional policies and federal regulations, spe specifically with uh, what it when it relates to faculty uh, training and development and and all the uh, policies etc that need to be communicated things we need to be improved because yes we need to improve and this is an ongoing process that we of reconceptualization reconceptualizing our faculty development program we need to uh, improve active and regular engagement we have a couple of faculty members that are very active but then again we have people that have never accessed the community even though we've done many uh, efforts the visual presentation of the of the community i'm not I don't like how it looks right now. We don't like how it looks. I, it could be better. It could have a more pleasant uh, aesthetic and organization, etc. Also, the internal community uh, internal community management processes, enrollment actualizations. Because right now, we have to go every term. We have to ask for. Uh, IT center to give us a list of faculty members and we need to do that process very manually because we cannot do it at the moment to be automatic. So this process is very manual and it's kind of cumbersome as well. How you can do something like this at your institution, you can establish the purpose of your community of practice, whether it's communication, compliance, training and development, etc. You need to familiarize yourself with your learning management system see if it has any of these uh features if it doesn't you can use like a regular course and then have people join that course approach the design of the community as you would do with a course think of objectives content and activities like i said we, when we approached it we did like some uh, backwards design and, and we start we need to reconceptualize many things in there and then intentionally uh, design, build, and sustain for interaction and engagement, as well as plan for adaptability, adaptability and scalability. And this is a link to a path that I created for this session. Uh, if you have any questions about any of these specific activities, you have comments, ideas, you can post it in then, and we we will keep engaging uh, after this session is over through there. And also you can use the hashtag think outside the workshop on Twitter and LinkedIn. And I'll be monitoring those uh, throughout the week to see how the conversations keep going. So. Rolando, a couple of questions in the chat. Okay. Um, are you open? Yes. Um, so um, Hope from the SUNY Coil Center asked what the platform is for your community of practice, where those discussion boards were located. Okay, it's, uh, we use the communities uh, area in Blackboard. We use Blackboard Learn as our learning management system, and we use the, their communities feature, and we created a, uh, like a, a course there, because it kind of works like a, a course. and. Then we uh, created all the areas and the we use the discussion uh, forum features to use those uh, like boards for faculty to discuss their ideas, to ask their questions, etc. And then Megan Wright asked, um, was that uh, self-monitored between faculty, those discussions, or did your department have to manually monitor all the different questions and conversations? How did you manage that? The first, uh, like the first couple of months, we were like looking into what people were posting, see if we had to moderate anything. Then it was very curious to see uh, a couple of faculty members very excited that they had this opportunity. And then they started moderating and answering to other questions that they helped out. And actually, we love that uh, faculty members would take on that role so we could have more time to the other initiatives. But right now we still need to uh, create like some clear guidelines and engage, officially engage people as moderators. So, hey, can you take care of this discussion for him? Can you take care of uh, updating information, make sure that the information that's uploaded is relevant to the topic, et cetera. We still need to uh, work that, work on that. Oh, Rolando, uh, the hashtag that you mentioned, is it think outside the box or think outside the workshop? The workshop. Sorry, sorry. Okay, thank you.
any other questions? Um, all right. So yes, one more. Um, Woody is asking, is there any thematic topic or guideline for faculty to get them involved in this uh, community of practice? Well, what the only criterion we use for enrolling faculty in this community when we started it, it was in the middle of the pandemic. So it was anyone that was teaching at our institutions because we were everyone was moving remote and we needed to uh, make sure we were able to reach out to them. So that was the only uh, criterion we used. But then we uh, we have kept it because eventually the institution saw the value of having all faculty members in just one virtual space. And many of the compliance and communication efforts were done through there. So the thematics in terms of, of, of discussions in itself are we had the resources, like, let me go back and show you screenshot over here. Okay. The technical questions. So how would I, uh, we, we knew that many faculty members had questions on how to build a test or how to import this or how to upload this document. So we created one for technical support and we did one for faculty to share their best practices uh it has been funny because the the posts that we have seen on there in, in that form are not necessarily sharing best, best practices but are linked to other topics as well one that was took us by surprise was resources where uh faculty members started uh sharing articles uh videos related uh to online learning remote learning etc there's a fourth one i think about uh um, suggestions for us. It, it's called Suggestion Box, so they can leave suggestions for us. And so far, we haven't gotten many through there. They have been through internal messages or emails. Uh, I don't, we have to create that culture of giving feedback and feeling comfortable with doing publicly and uh, understand that we appreciate that openness and, and that criticism. Okay, I think we're good. Okay. And the second event we worked on was uh, the academic year uh, kickoff event. This is a event that we do every August and or the purpose of this uh, event is to send faculty energized and power into the classrooms. We know that at campus level, many of them offer uh, different activities on how to use the LMS, how to use the different systems, how to do technological integration. So we want to focus on bigger things, on, on the teaching aspect of, of online learning. And we have varied the format of this event. The first time we did it was like a, a keynote and we had concurrent sessions throughout the day. And then topics included academic literacy, social presence, data protection, blogs, uh, gamification, curriculum review, internationalization of the curriculum, and more others. And then last year, last August, we did uh, express workshops, like a one hour workshops, 45 minute workshops, uh, back to back on a topic. So we uh, wouldn't make faculty have to choose between this session or the other. So we decided to do back-to-back -back, uh, workshops on how to do specific things like uh, high impact practices on how co to communicate and interact with students from different generations there was another one on um, uh, partnering the partnering strategy and we at, in the afternoons we would offer conferences related to curriculum internationalization uh, with uh, guest speakers from other institutions. And we did this through invitations and using our own internal resources. And we haven't spent any money in any of these activities. Like I said, we have a very, very limited budget. And to do this, the tools we use were Blackboard Collaborate, which is a video conferencing software we use at our institution, and Watermark Course Evaluations and Surveys, which is uh, was formerly known as Evaluation Kits for Session Evaluations. Because after every, every session, we uh, have the survey and we evaluate what we what faculty are saying, and then we go and act on it, and we try to improve for the next time we do that. And something we started, uh, you know, 
doing for any of our activities or faculty development activities, we require faculty to sit through and participate through at least 80% of the session total time. Uh, so, so if they want to get a certificate, if they want to be reported as present in that uh, training and development activity, they have to complete or participate a minimum of 80% of this session total time. And because we want to make sure also uh, that if we're issuing a certificate, some saying someone would, went through a workshop on uh, instructional design, that person sat through the entire workshop. It, they didn't log in and then logged out 15 minutes after or logged in uh, 30 minutes late and they was, was there for the last 20 minutes. And we try, we, we call these teachable moments because they they don't, faculty don't like uh, that behavior from their students. So we try to say, this is what you don't like for your students to do. This is what we don't like for faculty to do. We are, this is a teachable moment for you. So how did it go? The attendance for year one was uh, 1,400 faculty members and for year two it was 436. We knew that because the first time it was offered was during the pandemic. Most people were trying to understand how to work with everything online. And we had a lot of faculty that have, weren't familiar with teaching online, teaching remotely. And then last year, maybe we were trying to figure out if it was the formats or if it was the dates we offered them because it was spread out through different uh, weeks. Uh, it was a lower participation from our faculty members. And then, however, the, the feedback for both events were very, was very positive. Things we need to improve, increase event attendance, as you can see. Uh, the accessibility of the materials used by presenters. We always include them in checklists, but we want to make sure that every event that we offer has accessible materials and that uh, presenters emulate the best practices that we are trying to promote. And we also need to, to uh, strengthen that part. And we also have to plan for asynchronous engagement. There's still much to be, uh, much for, there's a, a room for, to grow for us uh, in terms of asynchronous engagement, uh, teach faculty how they can engage and, and be part of like a community that is not locked in a, a, at the same moment, that uh, locked on at the same moment, it, that it can be in different times and they can still feel part of the community and they can still contribute actively to something that is happening there. How you can do this is align the event to the topics uh, the events topics to the needs of your faculty, uh, simplify the processes <laughs> for event registration, sending out access link and sending out certificates. The first time we did this, we had uh, Microsoft uh, sign up forms and then uh, people would not include the whole uh, the entire email address or they would write it uh, wrong or they would miss on a period or a letter and they didn't get the information or the registration link. So that's when we decided to move everything and they would access it through the community of practice where the link would always be available during the, uh, the, the schedule time. So we, we've been working on simplifying the process for registration, sending out the links and, and sending out certificates. At the moment, this is the most cumbersome part because we don't have anyone to do those certificates. We're trying to, uh, find a way to do it uh, that is automated. Then choose presenters that exemplify the best practices and evaluate the event and use feedback to improve future interactions. And I will, this will be in almost every initiative. Use uh, evaluate and use feedback to improve. I see. I okay. Two questions. Uh, one question in the chat. Uh, it says, were there any ways that faculty could tie these to their portfolios promotion uh, tenure materials? Yes. Uh, at our institution, part of the portfolio asks them to include activities, professional development activities, and they usually turn in this uh, certificates as part of, of that portfolio. But then we've been very strict on what uh, on who do we issue those uh, certificates to because we want them to understand that this is not any a conference. It, it, it should have an impact on your development. It should have an impact on your evaluation, on your tenure, and on teaching and learning. Okay, the other initiative we worked on was a best practices showcase. What we did is it was an asynchronous event to showcase the faculty's best practices in online courses. And uh, these best practices had to be creative 
they had to be impactful, replicable, and quality frame. And this event, we also have tweaked it uh, every year because of what happens. We take the learnings and we improve on it. But right now, what we do is do like a call for proposals. Uh, we open that call for proposals so faculty can submit their best practices. We have been uh, last, the first time we offered it, we, we had like a one month, uh, two months, a, a two month frame, time frame, but we didn't get as many submissions and we decided to open the call for proposals in May and still we're not getting as many submissions as we would like. And then proposal evaluation and selection, we form a committee with representative from various offices, you know, if in our vice presidency, such accreditation, student services, curricular development, internationalizations. Uh, and this committee evaluates the proposals using a rubric that we created on Microsoft Forms. And the proposals with the highest ratings in any other event uh, are selected for the event and their propo uh, proponents are notified via email. Then uh, they have the presenters that are set to present, and then they are given a ton of time to record uh, a 30 minute presentation of their best practice using a fo the following format introduction, description of their practice, explanation of why their practice is a good practice and how it contributes to the quality of online learning. We, we want to make sure that it is very clear for everyone that these practices are embedded in, in, in some standards, in some quality standards, and then contribute to the overall quality of the program. Demonstration of how, where, and when the practice was uh, applied, and then recommendations on how to play, replicate the practice because uh, some of the feedback that we got is, okay, it was a good uh, presentation, but I don't think I could use it in my discipline. So we try to give uh, make uh, those presenters think a little bit outside the, the box in this case, and see how they can translate that into other disciplinary fields. And then the recordings are made using Blackboard Collaborate. Uh, then we do uh, we post a uh, the first time we post uh, re the recordings in uh, as a discussion post in the idea center of the community of practices, but we couldn't keep track and of who was interacting with uh, which presentation. And we asked all presenters to keep uh, tabs on their own presentations and try to interact with the audience. But that format wasn't as successful as what we did this year, which was embed the videos in a RISE course and then publish that course. And then we could see who was uh, who had gone through all the presentations and, and we could have that feedback loop integrated. And this is uh, of all the experiences that we offer. This is the one that requires, at least for me, the, the least time, effort and resources to coordinate because many of the things, once you sit down and write them down and have the templates and the emails and everything else, then it usually smooth to, to organize. So how did it go? Uh, last year we received uh, uh, 22 proposals for which eight were selected and this year, meaning uh, last October, we received fewer proposals out of the 14 proposals that were submitted. We selected seven, uh, only like three or four and uh, making the record uh, recording and then those were published then things we need to improve on this uh, uh, initiative to increase the amount of submissions improve the quality of submissions, communicate the validity of the event, because sometimes our faculty thinks that only best practices count when they're done outside the institution for other organizations, for other institutions or agencies. So this is a, a, an event that is as valid as those events and is as important as those events. Plan for greater asynchronous engagement, like I said before, uh, how you can do or implement an activity like this is define what a best practice looks at your institution. Ponder what characteristics it should have. Preferably, they should be framed within institutional policies and practice, so you can tie that to uh, policies that you have, practices that are institutionalized. Outline the requirements for the proposal. Decide on whether the modality of the event is asynchronous or synchronous. The other um, thing is to evaluate the event and use feedback to improve future iterations. I The other event uh, related to that one, typically the kickoff event is in August. 
the best practices is in October, then we have National Distance Learning Week in November. And uh, this we did from one year, the second year we, we didn't have enough time to create a program that was uh, very robust to us, so we decided to not do it. But it, it, what we did was were synchronous webinars in celebration of National Distance Learning Week. And we chose people uh, from our institution. The first time we did it was using a professor from one of our campuses to present his study on the development of distance learning programs in Puerto Rico. We also did a panel from professors from different uh, campuses as well as from the law school to discuss the challenges and opportunities they face when transitioning to remote learning. We uh, used faculty that were from disciplines that are typically taught face to face uh, so they could see if they did it you know you can move some things online you can move your whole experience online and we had two professors from boston college and uh, university of arizona respectively share their recommendations on uh, for increasing the visibility of academic research and also as part of this event we created on wakelet a repository of resources on distance learning uh, some of our faculty members some of our uh, external agencies, organizations, like the Online Learning Consortium, USCLA, HETS. Uh, this is a book written by one of our faculty members in San Germán campus. How did it go? Uh, the first time we did it, and so far the only time that we've done it, we had over 2,200 uh, people attend these webinars. We need to improve external participation because we want to invite other people from other institutions, from other countries, join us and take part of that event. Also include other voices in the discussions, not the usual suspects. You know, we have faculty members that we know they log into every event or activity that we do. They're very active in the participation. You know, those are usual usual suspects. We know who they are. They're always uh, willing to pitch in, willing to collaborate. We need to find those vo uh, voices that are at the, in the margin at the moment, and we need to bring them in and let them be heard and, and amplify their 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 work. How you can do this is to find the purpose uh, for developing activities for National Distance Learning Week. Search uh, your institution for faculty and administrators who are leaders or are making great contributions to the field of distance education. And always, like I said, evaluate and use feedback to improve. So before we cover the rest of the presentation or the initiatives, I just wanna make sure that you guys are there, that everyone's here with me still. And give me a little bit of feedback on what do you think about this uh, initiative so far? You can write unimpressed if you are hearing ideas and practices you have already know, you already know, or you have heard before. You can write overwhelmed uh, if you're experiencing information overload for trying to figure out ways to implement them at your institution or excited if your mind is blown by these practices and this is a space space to communicate and give feedback so we're seeing a lot of excited and interesting okay overwhelmed good 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 don't worry everything that i cover in this presentation will be available to you through that link uh, that alexandra uh shared within the uh chat and you will have access to some of the templates, the links, and materials we use. And you can, you have also access to the Padlet where you can reach out and ask any questions, collaborate, give feedback, etc. So, I'm going to talk now about the I think would be more our most success, uh, successful initiative in our faculty development program is called uh, the mentoring program for interactive uh, instructional design. And this program was developed because we had acquired uh, an institutional license for Articulate 360 and we had given those uh, licenses to the different campuses, but they were not they they were not being used. They were not used and we were worried and we said, you know what, let's take these uh, licenses and give them directly to faculty, but there's a catch. Um, 
we will teach them how to use those uh, tools. We will give them access so they can create new materials, but they also, they, they need to create something for us, something that everyone can use. So the Programa de Mentoría en Diseño Instructional Interactivo is Spanish for the Mentoring Program for instruct, Interactive Instructional Design. We train faculty to use RISE 360 in the design of interactive lessons uh, for their online hybrid and technology assisted courses. We also teach them some of uh, theoretical and practical principles, principles of readability, usability, accessibility, and design thinking. Uh, we also tell them about storytelling and how they should engage their students through storytelling as well. Participants of the program, like I said, are required to create an interactive lesson that we use in our institutional catalog for online resources. This is, uh, sorry for a typo here, it was supposed to launch in the October 2021, but we have some technical difficulties trying to find the best way to uh, uh, use uh, create this repository. but. This is a repository of lessons on different topics that are available to all of our faculty and that, that they, they can integrate into their own uh, courses. And the selection of participants is based on several criteria, including the availability of license, the percentage of representation of the academic unit of, or, of origin. For example, we wanna make sure that every academic unit or campus is represented and that many fields or disciplinary fields are represented among others. For example, uh, for this cohort that we have for spring, most of the faculty are from STEM disciplines because we wanted to focus on STEM disciplines because they had uh, low participation in previous cohorts. And throughout the year, we offer three cohorts of the program. We have the fall cohort, the spring cohort, and then the summer cohort. And as part of their participation in the program, they receive access to the institutional license of Articulate 360. And at the end of the program, we evaluate if it's worth extending uh, that license for an additional six months. But if we do, they have to create an additional lesson for that repository or that catalog. And these are some of the tools they learn to use uh, during that program, RISE, Content Library, Preview 360, which we use for uh, feedback processes. Then Microsoft Teams, we created a community in practice in Microsoft Teams. We use Blackboard Collaborate for the uh, mentoring sessions and get images for specific uh, for images that are, we have a license for getting images and for uh, disciplines that are very hard to combine like a human anatomy or physiology, blood or organs, et cetera, we use, we give them access to this license as well. And uh, participants, we created the, the program so par that participants could uh, choose their own path for completing the program. They could use every resource we provide to them, which is an asynchronous course, uh, individual mentoring and group mentoring sessions, or if they're at the intermediate level, they then can use only group at the asynchronous course and then uh, individual mentoring sessions or at least one group session. And then those that are very advanced in their uh, technique, uh, in their skills and the technological skills, well, then they can build their own way of completing the program. Right now, we change a little bit how we do the mentoring process because there's only two of us, uh, uh, two mentors in the programs. And usually we have a 20, which is to work with 20 to 30 faculty members. So for this time, we're doing uh, only group mentoring sessions. And during that uh, very frequent, one every two, every two Fridays, we have one group mentoring session. And then we teach them to do something. First, we started to teach them uh, um, instructional design best practices on creating inclusive uh, online resources, and then on how to use the tool. Then we have to, we want to do like a design screen uh, on, so they can design based on the use of uh, the student, not on their preferences, but on, but on their students' pre uh, preferences. And how did it go? This has been, like I said, our most successful faculty development experience. We have to turn people down every, uh, every, for every cohort because we get many, many uh, requests, but we can accommodate all because of the licenses, because we need to be make sure we can be good instructors in the process. So far, we have had like four pilot uh, cohorts uh, that were from uh, February to July 2021. Then we had the fall cohort and then the spring cohort that is currently started in January and ends in May. 
and then we call this the alumni from pilots those are we decided to extend the license and they want to keep creating creating we have about 29 that decided to stay and things we need to improve uh, increased participation of STEM faculty, which we're currently working on, develop strategies to help faculty become better independent learners. Like I said, we're only two and we cannot be every, every moment of the, of, the, of the learning process with them. And we need to help them become better independent learners and use an asynchronous course and reach out when they really need to. Increase the number of uh, mentors. There's only two of us. We started incorporating one. It's kind of like a mentoring training. He went through the program as a participant. Now he's a mentor in training, and we hope that for future cohorts, he can be one of the mentors and have the same responsibilities as us. And we want to uh, eventually replicate the, replicate this program at campus level because we need for it to be sustainable. And uh, so campus, uh, they offer this program at their level and they can have their own mentors, et cetera. Rolando, there's a couple of questions. Uh, can you take them? Um, yeah. The first is, are the, these faculty resources OER? This is from Camille Carlson. Not necessarily. I mean, they're, they're open uh, resources for all faculty at the institution. Anyone that, uh, uh, how their design is that if I'm an instructor and I'm teaching a course on, um, let's see, nursing course, and there's a lesson on, pharmacokinetics and I can use that and incorporate it into my course into my course that I'm teaching at the institution mm -hmm. okay but that um, would be a good idea we could explore actually <laughs> that if, if we could turn those into OER and we could amplify the the scope and the impact of that work I, I really like the sound of that yep. um, the, the uh, next question was could you explain design sprints please that sounds great that's from Karen Caldwell Design sprints are from uh, the field of uh, user experience design, and it's basically where you use this uh, typically in a week and you try to overcome, take this on this problem or challenge and try to come up for a solution and you prototype, IDA prototype, and then test the solution. Uh, and we want to do something, we want to take a, a modified version of the, what that is in, in user experience design so that they can kind of prototype their lesson, but it's based on user or student needs and challenges specifically, or because typically our faculty uh, tends to design thinking on how they learn, for example. Uh, business administration faculty usually use case studies because that's what they use when they were learning business administration. Psychology uh, faculty members, they use uh, reflections because, well, they use reflections when they were learning and so we're trying to break up with that and, and and design based on who we're actually receiving in our classrooms who is actually our student at our institution and that would help uh, a lot if, if they can change and design for who we are serving instead of designing for ourselves and what what we think would be great and there's a process of empathizing thinking about the needs the pain points uh, etc Rolando, is there a resource that you um, uh, think is particularly helpful in understanding um, uh, design thinking or design sprints? Is something that you turn to? I mean, there's a lot of stuff out there when you, you know, when yes. you were just wondering if you had something on the top of your head. At the top of my head, no, I know this, there's a book on the on design sprints, on the guy that created design sprints. There's also a course uh, in Google, uh, Coursera, but a course by Google is a certification. But I think if you just want to do like uh, understand what's uh, in a design, uh, the design screen and um, think and get a mindset on, on user experience design, it's called the fundamentals of uh, user experience design. It's in Coursera. It's a good uh, parting point as well. I know um, OLC offers some workshops related to that, like the personas, UX experience, et cetera. Great, thank you. Oh, oh uh, there's another question from Ian August. Do you have a different strategy to reach adjunct faculty or faculty with very busy schedules and little time for PD? Uh, what we try to do to reach out faculty, uh, adjunct faculty, is try to schedule things in different times because typically at the campus level, what they do is schedule 
faculty de development activities during the day and most of our adjuncts are working their full-time jobs during the, that we also move a lot of things asyn asynchronously so they can participate uh actually we had we started integrating uh adjunct faculty in these programs in the summer cohort and we had some adjunct faculty members that have been really great like i have we have one that is from criminal justice and he had to design just one lesson he ended up designing four <laughs> and he wants to design more in, in, in teaching just one or two courses at our institution. But we we are, appreciate that that commitment and we appreciate that engagement. So uh, we we actually is one of the few people that extend the license and he still has the license. And then Camille is asking, are faculty paid stipends for participation? No, they're not paid anything. Their uh, the payment you would say for this uh, uh, is having access to a license that would help you. I mean, having the, going through the mentoring process and, and learning how to use um, a new tool and how to create an experience. But there's not a stipend. It's like you know you have access to this license, which costs you about a thousand dollars per year if you would to pay it uh, by yourself. It's the same as images and well. And it, it's very interesting because we have, and we tell them in, in the, every time we have the sign-up sheet, we tell them this is going to take about 45 hours. It depends on, you know, how do you learn or your preferences, your needs uh, as a learner. And uh, we need you to have that time commitment and you can finish in less if you, you know, work with the plan, et cetera. But we, we, we haven't used any stipend for any of these activities. These are voluntary. And what we've seen is right at this moment, at least historical time at our institution that we want, we see faculty wanting to get involved as long as you become facilitators to them, as long as you help them out. You know, they have a great idea, help them out, implement it. They have a great course they wanna teach, just give them the tools and the resources so they can do it. And, and at least our institution and right now is what we'd be uh, uh, getting from the, the feedback we've been getting. Rolando, we have about three minutes left. How are you doing? Yes, uh, I'll just uh, talk, go over this really quickly. It's a beta tester program. It's just a, a do we do testing with different technologies and we, uh, we told faculty, hey, do you want to join a program where you get to try out any tools before anyone else? and give us feedback on whether we should adopt it or whether we should uh, uh, discard it, et cetera. And we created the inter-online beta testers program and we have done testing programs for WebEx. It's a video conferencing application, Sendesk, which we use for our help desk, Labster simulations, RISE, a proctoring. We're right now doing one with Small, which is a proctoring solution uh, and then Teams. Uh, testing the video conference solution to see if we should move to another option. And we take that, we, we use uh, some qualitative and quantitative measures and we try to incorporate that and try to use our decisions based on that. Things we need to uh, improve, testing phase and processes, methods for collecting data and user feedback. And the other initiatives includes, like I said, self-paced courses, a faculty starter kit, uh, where we, if there's a person that's starting to teach an online course for the first time, it has everything you need to do, uh, and it's a self-paced as well. And just to recap, right, the key takeaways from these presentations is to assess your faculty development program. It's okay to recognize that it's, if it's not working, we need to, if that's the first step, hey, we need to improve, and then start doing what we need to do to improve it. Define competencies because it's easier when they, the instructors can see a tangible uh, what's behind it, what's behind the, the or faculty development program. Are we just offering activities just for the sake of offering activities on these topics or is it because it's related to something that's beneficial for what we do every day? Know the needs, align with institutional objectives so it can have a bigger impact so we you can help you by get by uh, with your buying process from different areas count on your people sometimes we tend to look uh, outside but we have many 
good resources and experts in-house and then plan, implement, evaluate and revise like we do with instructional design. It's a continuous process and we started doing this every every for every event and we're constantly revising what we're doing and trying to do better and take that uh, feedback into consideration. And before we go, I would like appreciate if you could give a feedback on this session by going to Menti and entering code 72767419. And also, uh, if you could engage with uh, the rest of the participants, as well with, as with myself, in the Padlet we have uh, created and the Think Outside the Workshop hashtag on Twitter and LinkedIn. And that will be all. And thank you very much. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, there's a couple of questions in the, in the chat. Um, uh, let me see if I can find it now. Oh, is your starter kit on a public facing website? No, actually, it's in the community of practice. Okay. And um, Woody is asking, can they use the licensed tools outside this program? Not entirely sure. What yes, uh, that for the articulate, yes. Uh, what they're told is that you can use this for your presentations in the classroom, for a presentation in a professional conference such as these. Uh, you know, you can use it. For us, you need to create that lesson. That's your commitment to us. And you have this tool to create other uh, resources for your every course you have. All right. Any other questions uh, for Rolando? Did he share his contact information? Um, yes, yeah. let me... It's on the screen. It should be on the screen right now. Well, I want to say a very, um, you know, uh, heartfelt thank you, Rolando, for uh, joining us and for your um, very timely presentation. We're in the middle of a huge migration to a new learning management system and, and digital learning environment and revamping um, many of our um, you know, processes and approaches. And I thought it was very timely to have um, your presentation for um, our community and our broader communities. Uh, and very, very happy to um, have um, you know, have had you here at the summit with us today. Thank you so very much. It was awesome. Thank you for uh, the invitation. And it was a pleasure uh, participating and uh, sharing my experiences with you all. So all of the, um, the stuff that was shared in the chat and the links and everything will be made available to you um, through the conference website. Um, and um, I'm hoping that we'll, um, you know, get all of that together as quickly as we can uh, to so that you'll be able to refer back to it. The recording and the chat uh, will also be made available to everyone. Um, the next, I think that's, I think that's it. Thank you again, uh, Rolando. That was really um, fabulous to have you. I just took your picture. Thank you. <laughs> um, so let's see, what is, this is such a fun way to kick off this, um, this, uh, uh, this summit. And, uh, you know, uh, we have a number of amazing things happening this week um, and amazing things still happening today in addition to um, our welcome that we had and our update this morning and Rolando's fabulous presentation. Um, we have our Effective Practices Award winners that will be recognized. Um, and Erin, is that at 1.30? at one o'clock. One o'clock, sorry, one o'clock. I don't have the calendar mm -hmm. in front of me. And then later this afternoon, uh, we have a networking session for instructional designers. We're gonna have networking sessions for varied roles. If you don't, 
if you're not an instructional designer, you can still come. We are one big happy family and community, very um, open and hoping that um, folks will want to come and network and talk about the presentations that we've um, been to or the ones that are coming up and to just share and network and get together virtually just to unwind a little bit and, and to chat. So I hope you will join us for the ID session, uh, networking session this afternoon and look on the program for other networking opportunities um, throughout the week. Uh, we even have our, our famous Summit After Dark, which will be on Wednesday. So I'm really looking forward to um, uh, doing that with my friends, uh, John Zalnak and Michelle Ford and Aaron Maney and Rob Pierkowski. So hopefully you will join us for, um, for any and all of the sessions that you are interested in. Check the program. Um, the times are in Eastern time for our friends of SUNY who may not be in, in our time zone. Um, and again, everything will be recorded and, um, and the links will be posted with all the materials um, as soon as we can get them together. Um, oh, Aaron's promoting the UN session. Uh, if you've never been to a summit um, and haven't participated in the UN session, I hope you will consider. Um, you have three minutes to do a mini presentation of your own and to share something um, uh, cool that you're doing with the rest of the community. I just wonder if people noticed how many of the wonderful things that Rolando does that we also do uh, and that we can do more of and better of um, uh, and how those can um, trickle down into the, um, the campus activities that you do. Um, so yeah, um, really happy to, um, to have had Rolando here with us. Um, muchísimas gracias, Rolando. Muy encantada de conocerte y muy encantada de, de compartir, um, uh, de compartir todo lo que tienes para, para compartir con toda nuestra comunidad. Very thank, very, very, very heartfelt thanks. <laughs>